Mm. It's all good news. You can relax. You know, we ought to be more relaxed in the house of God than we are anywhere in the world because this is where you belong. This is family. This is what God has for his people. Out of the rat race, out of the craziness, he's, he's carved out a little slice of heaven. And for, for me, it's called the Passion Church and my Passionite brothers and sisters because we're passionate about loving Jesus. Amen? Amen. I, always, I wasn't always passionate about Jesus. I used to be what you call a counterfeit Christian. Uh, if you would have asked me, I would have said, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. But I didn't truly believe. There was no, his spirit was not in my heart, not leading and guiding me into all truth, so to speak. I had my own truth. I was sitting on the throne of my own life. I remember, I, w I was a counterfeit Christian. I wasn't a Christmas Christian. I believe a Christmas Christian is those who believe and understand the significance of the time which we're celebrating. When God became a man and came to the earth, when God gave us a restart, came and redeemed our hearts from wickedness and the, the promise of destruction and weeping and gnashing of teeth in hell, he saved us from all that. I'm telling you, it's good news. I'm telling you, Christmas ought to be celebrated. You can argue about when to celebrate it and how to celebrate it if you want to, but I'm just going to celebrate it. I'm celebrating that my Lord came for me. He's my Redeemer, and he set me free. Let's pray to him. Father, let your will be done here today. Help me to be a mouthpiece for you, just to simply speak what you, you would have me say. Show me and lead me and guide me and open our hearts to receive. I'm here to receive too, Lord. I, I'm anxious to hear what you would say to me and say through me today. I know it's good. I know your plans for us are good to give us a hope and a future. I just pray that we'll all get our eyes on Jesus. I pray that there's revival in the church again, Lord. I know we've been through tough times, and I know a lot of us are beat down, and the world is trying to zombify us, but I come against that in Jesus' name. I say, awake, O oh, you sleepers. And rise, for the coming of the Lord Jesus is at hand. Wake up. The time is now. Father, give us this revival in our hearts. Let us have oil in our lamps, God, when you come back. I pray for those who are not here today, that they would get this message. Wake up. Wake up, for the time is now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Like I said, I was a counterfeit Christian. I wasn't really a Christmas Christian. I remember one Christmas when I was in my early 20s. I was so far away from God. I, my grandmother had, I was down there visiting my grandmother in Shaw, Mississippi. They had this little Catholic church that she would talk me into going to, you know. And a little bitty small traditional Catholic church. And my heart was far from it. I didn't want to go, but. I had promised my Mimi that I would go. And uh, that Saturday night, I went out. And boy, did I go out. I had a little friend down there. We went out. We started drinking. And we started drinking heavy. Somewhere along the night, about, you know, early, you know, 11, 30, 12, so, he got arrested for public drunk. My friend did. Nah, it didn't slow me down. I kept on drinking. <laughs> I didn't go. I was so drunk, I didn't even try to get him out. I mean, that's, I just kept, I went from nightclub to nightclub. I don't remember how I got home, when I got home, and I drove home. Isn't that scary? Don't you look back at your life and say, God, you must have had a plan. You must have, you must have, it was Jesus was taking the wheel, whether I told him to or not. And I mean, I got home. And it seemed like I'd no sooner laid my eyes to sleep when my grandmother was knocking on the door. It's time for church. Now, do you think that's what I wanted to hear? But my Mimi was relentless, and she kept after me until I got up out of that bed. And I don't remember much of that. I was still drunk when I went to church that day. I sat on that pew, and my head was swimming, and my stomach was growling, and I was like, 
I'm glad this is a Catholic church because I know they only go in an hour. <laughs> but then they want to kneel and sit and stand and kneel and sit and stand again. I was doing all I could just to not hurl all over church. Well, after they did what they did and the preacher man, I guess they call him the priest, the priest says, the mass is ended, go in peace. And, and the response from the congregation is always, what is it? No, peace be with you is another. And they say, they say, huh? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Or, or they say something when you say the mass is ended. And they say, praise be to God or something like that. <laughs> and I, know, I hadn't said nothing the whole service, but when he said the, the mass is ended, I said, praise be to God. <laughs> That was the only time I got involved in the whole sermon there. <laughs> and so I jumped up and took off. I ran right past the priest and everybody at the door trying to shake my hand. And I ran out to my grandmother's car. And I was going to try to quietly, I was fixing the, and I was going to try to do it with the door open. But everybody was looking at me, so I shut the door and hurled right there in the back of her back seat. All over the back seat. My Mimi and my Papa all came around. They said, what's that smell? Boy, what'd you do? I said, I'm sick. And my Mimi, being so innocent, she says, oh, my poor boy's got a stomach flu or something, you know. <laughs> Let me get him home, and I'll take care of him. You see, I, Christmas didn't really mean anything to me. You look at the world, most people, that Christmas doesn't mean anything to them. Because uh, I, they're not looking for Jesus. They're not celebrating Jesus. I wasn't looking for Jesus. But I tell you who was looking for Jesus in the Bible. There was a prophet named Simeon. And at the time of Jesus' birth, he had been spending his whole life waiting for the Messiah to come. And the Holy Spirit had revealed to him that he was an old man. He said, you'll not die until you've seen the Messiah. You've seen the Lord's gift to man. So he was waiting. Eight days after Jesus was born, Joseph and Mary took the little baby to be circumcised at the temple, as was the custom. And the Holy Spirit told Simeon about it. And so Simeon went there, and when he saw the baby, he was filled with wonder. And in Luke chapter 2, verse 29, Simeon prophesied, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you have promised. I have seen your salvation. See, he understood that Jesus is our salvation. There's no other name by which a man can be saved but at the name of Jesus. Without Jesus, we'd be all lost, dead in our sins and trespasses. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God. I want you to say that. He is a light to reveal God. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. And then Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, the baby's mother, the child is destined to call many in Israel, uh, cause many in Israel to fall and many others to rise. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Say, many hearts will be revealed. You see, there's a lot of revealing going on at the birth of Jesus. At the name of Jesus. There's a lot of things revealed about a person. What you believe about Jesus means a whole lot. He is a light to reveal God. And like Jesus says, I'm either this, the rock on which you stand or the rock that's going to crush you in the end. That's going to fall on you. You can't feel two ways about Jesus. You can't claim to be a Christian and not love Him. And not serve Him. So He came to reveal, as a light to reveal God. And in the process, our hearts are revealed. There's a scripture that says that many of us don't want to come into the light because 
We're afraid that our sins will be revealed. We want to stay in the darkness. But you got to. There's only two kinds of people, and it's not black and white. It's not male and female. It's not rich and poor. It's those living in the light and those living in the darkness. Those who trust in Jesus and those who don't. Jesus was raised in a generation splitting hairs over their religiosity. You want to say that again? He grew up. He came to, well, he came to the world he created, and we couldn't find room for him to be born in the end. And he came to a world that was just steeped in religiosity. It was all about religion, his rules and regulations. They, they congratulated each other about their knowledge of the do's and don'ts. That's what they thought religion was. 1 Corinthians 8 verse 1 says, But knowledge puffeth up, while love builds up. You see so many people sitting on the pews today know more scripture than any of us. But they have no love. They're all puffed up. And they, they're led astray by uh, their pride. Well, I know more than everybody about end times. I know more about everybody than, than you know, the resurrection. I know more than everybody. And they can, they can preach a good game. But there's no love. And so you, we have to decide, are we going to be head Christians or, or heart Christians? Because Jesus said, to, in the end, he said, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. You can't, you can't knowledge your way into a relationship with God. You can't say, I know about Jesus, but not know Jesus. And the churches are full of people like that. That have no real relationship. They've reduced God to a belief system. Well, I know the, all the things I'm supposed to believe. They've reduced love to a theory. Not something you're supposed to live out. These people didn't want to do the word. They just wanted to argue about it. But Jesus came to reveal the word, didn't he, Kirsty? Jesus came to reveal the word because he is the word. Christmas is when the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Christmas is when the word began to demonstrate itself for us. Jesus is the author. And Christmas is when the author of your life and your story was revealed. He's the character behind all the characters. This, is, this, this book, you can read it with a religious mind. You can search for it just simply for knowledge with no heart connection. You won't get anything. You'll be, I've, seen them, I've seen shows with them guys that got PhDs in religiosity. Bible knowledge. And you listen to them talk and you say, what planet are you from? That's not what I get from the Bible. You see, without the Spirit of God, you can't discern this spiritual book. Without the love of God, you won't understand any of its principles. You'll be led astray. You'll become hard-hearted, religious, with no relationship. Jesus put hands and feet to the precepts of God's word. He showed us the face of God. Do you understand? Jesus showed us God. Before that they had the written scriptures. And they talked about it. And they argued about it. But they didn't know the author. And it's when you see Jesus. That you understand. How the scriptures are to be determined. How they. The, the flavor Behind the script. You ever had a text from somebody and, man, you just thought, 
well, I'm going to get them back. And you just wrote something nasty, and then you, you realize that that wasn't even what they were saying? And many times you'll do that when you don't know the person that's texting you. But if Kaylee, my daughter, was to send me a text, and it, it sounded bad, I, I would say, oh, that's just Kaylee. She's, she's playing around, you know. But if it was somebody else, I, you know, I might look at it differently. I might not understand. So Jesus came to reveal the word. He's the written word. He's the rhema word. The revealed word. And with his spirit in your heart, this, this word becomes live to you. It will speak into your situation, to your life. Colossians 1.15 basically says Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. We didn't know what God looked like. We didn't know how to determine what he meant by his word until Jesus came. But in James 1.22 it says, don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. See, they weren't doing the word. They were just arguing about it. Jesus didn't say, if you love me, you will believe my commandments. Did he? Anybody know what he said? You will keep my commandments or obey my commandments. And you'll want to. You'll want to. If you love Jesus, it ain't hard doing the Word of God. It's hard not doing the Word of God. Especially in the long run, as many of us can attest. <laughs> it's in the doing that you'll go from knowing about God to knowing Him. It's as you do the Word. It's as you walk with Him. You understand? You won't read it for the first time, even if you get saved and you read it for the first time, it, a lot of it's not going to make sense to you. But if you're walking with God day by day, He'll begin to reveal His Word, His character. He'll be, you know, you'll get to know Him. You'll recognize the voice of your shepherd and the voice of a stranger you won't follow anymore. How many of you have been deceived so many times by that devil? He'll even come and disguise as an angel of light and you'll think, man, this has got to be God. And you'll be all confused. We're going to make mistakes. Just hang on. Keep walking with Jesus. Keep walking with him. You'll begin to learn his voice. You'll stay out of them gutters. Go from a head knowledge to a heart experience. That's what God wants for us. Apostle Paul, on one of his missionary journeys, came to the city of Athens. And as he was walking into the city, they had idols set up all alongside the road. Idol to the sun, idol to the moon, idol to the, the stars, to the creeks, for the valleys. I mean, they had idols for everything. They, they just had all kinds of gods. It was the most religious city in all the world. What did Paul do? Well, he saw one of the idols. They had so many idols, they didn't want to leave any gods out that it said to the unknown God, just in case they missed somebody. Well, we got you one over here. They were so religious, so superstitious. Paul said, I come to preach the unknown God to you. Because all this other stuff, this, and all they did all day long, these Greeks, they would sit and argue concepts and precepts. And suppose this and suppose that. All in an attempt to exalt themselves. And that's what self does, doesn't it? It always wants to promote self. It's only with Jesus' spirit in your heart that you begin to, to die to self and live to him. But Paul began to preach to them the unknown God. Let me tell you about a better way. Let me tell you about a little baby that was born in a manger. Let me tell you about a little baby that came to earth vulnerable to show us how much God loves us. Let me tell you about a little baby who grew up and was willing to die to take your sins. Paul said in Acts 17, 27, his purpose 
was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him, though he is not far from any of us. Isn't that good that God wants you to find him? Are you seeking God? Are you growing closer to him every day? That's why he sent Jesus, to, give, to, to, to be one of us, to, to give us something to, to cling to, to an understanding that, that God is approachable. That he wants, that the, Jesus came that the veil might be torn between a holy God and a sinful man. That we could come boldly into his throne of grace. Receive mercy. Jesus came to tear the veil that, and to show us that God is not far from any of us. So many of us are so, feel like we're so far from God because we've gone down so many roads. Well, let me just say, you may be far from your calling in life, but you're not far from God. God is with you wherever you go. God is there if you will cry out to Him in your lowest, darkest hour like they did in the jail, Paul and Silas. Athens was a knowledge-based model that produced powerless, self-serving religion. And that's what all the other false religions do. It's all about can you can you work your way into God's good grace, whatever their God is? It's a self, it makes self-serving religion. And we have self-serving Christians that come to church just so that they can say, I'm a Christian, that I'm a good person. But this Athens knowledge-based model prays, nevertheless, my will be done. It says, be warm and be fed, but then walks away. It raves, God is love, but it doesn't love. It acknowledges, God says tithe, but they don't tithe. It displays <laughs> puny pew sitters. That's usually sitting there criticizing the real go-getters. A lot of criticism going on, man. You ever been on a blog somewhere? And that's the most disgusting thing. I don't think it's real Christians. But if, if a, I've seen Christians announce something good. You know, my son got saved or something along those lines. And they're celebrating. They, po they post it or something. And then all the comments below, yeah, but that church, they don't believe in full immersion during baptism. That church don't have pews. They got padded chairs. You know, I've heard their music. That's from the devil. And it goes on and on and ripping each other apart. And if it is Christians saying those things, that's, that's just saying. But the, it's not just a one-time thing. I mean, every post. Do y'all know that that's a virtual world anyway? You ought to stay off of it. You, you, you really ought to live your own life and get off the virtual life. You, you really ought to stop letting the world zombify you. But that's beside the point. I'm sorry. These knowledge-based Religious, religiosity people. They know that Jesus is building a church, but they're not going to take up a sword or a trial to help. They say they, that Jesus said his house shall be a house of prayer, but they don't come to prayer. They don't pray. I'm asking you, join us on the wall. Let's not be that kind of church that just says they believe but don't do. Let's really do. James chapter 2 verse 14 says, What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, 
but you don't show it by your actions. Can that kind of faith save anyone? It's not saying that you're saved by your actions. It's just saying if you have faith, then the result will be actions. You'll prove out what you believe by your actions. If you don't believe, it'll be proven. You know, a tree shall be known by its fruit. You say you believe these core Christian principles, but are you living them out? That's why I prayed that God would revive us again. That we would, be, we would have revival and we would wake up. Because I truly believe that Jesus is coming back soon. And I know this, this world is lulling us to sleep. I know it's harder than it's ever been. I know you're getting older and your, your bones are creaking. And it seems like sickness and disease is prominent. But perhaps if we would have faith again, we could walk in health and wholeness. And we could believe that the Lord is our healer. Perhaps if we'd get back to the basics, get back to doing what we know to do, then we wouldn't be overwhelmed. It's because we have been distracted. Oh, look, a bell, a whistle. The world is out to distract you. But you don't want to stand before Jesus on that last day and say, well, you know, I watched all 427 episodes of Friends. You know, God, I was really good at, you know, golf or this or that. I'm not saying that, that golf is bad or nothing like that. I'm just saying... What is first in your life? God will give you the things that your soul desires. God will give you the finances. God will give you the health. God will give you the ability, the strength. He will renew your spirit and create a clean heart in you. But you've got to put Him first. Oh, and I want you to come back next Sunday because I got to, the Lord's given me a good message for Sunday. It's going to be a little short message. We're going to get out of here early. It's going to be on Christmas Eve at 1030 just for Sunday. Just like normal. I'll get you out of here early. But it's going to be a message you want to hear. So, you know, we're not religious counterfeits. I don't think we are at all. I don't mean to, to imply that today. I believe we are real deal. I believe we're Christmas Christians in here. I do. But I believe it's time to stir ourselves up in our most holy faith. I believe it's time to get back to some basics. I do believe that. You know, when I first came to this church, that's where I got saved. Did y'all know I got saved at this church? I was 32 years old before I finally came to myself, came to Jesus. And when I came here, I was a religious counterfeit for sure. I would have told people I was a Christian, but I wouldn't. But after I heard this good message, I, you know what it was about this church? I'd been to churches before, a lot of churches. But there was something about this church. There was, I had never seen people raise their hand in worship and say, actually sing the songs with their heart. I'd never seen people cry during worship. I'd never seen, I'd never heard the gospel preached like I heard it at this church. I'd never, I'd never walked into church and people want to hug me and shake my hand. And make me feel special. That was all at this church. When I came here. And so I, I, I was not looking for Jesus like Simeon. I came here looking for marriage counseling. If you want to be honest. That pastor was supposed to help my marriage. So I was going to sit through this service. But when I, when I came into this atmosphere. And I felt the love of God and a spirit of God for the first time in my life. I repented, and I became a Christmas Christian, and I stopped being a counterfeit. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 in the Amplified Version says, Test and evaluate yourself to see whether you're in the faith and living lives as committed believers. Examine yourselves, not me. <laughs> see, Paul was like, all of y'all judging me. 
Do you do that when you leave here? I forgive you. Pastor wasn't that good today. What, what was that message all about? I didn't get nothing from that. Well, look, how about we stop judging me and you judge you? Was you ready to receive today, huh? He said, examine yourselves, not me. Or do you not recognize this is about yourselves? By an ongoing experience that Jesus Christ is in you. That's the, that's the thing, is Jesus in you. If, you, if it, Jesus is not in you, his spirit is not in you, you're not one of his anyway. You're certainly a counterfeit Christian. Unless indeed you fail the test and are rejected as counterfeit. Well, if you feel like, hey, maybe, maybe I am counterfeit. I would tell people I'm a Christian, but I don't, I don't really have a relationship with God. I don't really believe that. I don't, I don't really live my life according to his word. I don't, I don't read his word. I don't know what his word is. I've never, based a, I've never prayed over a decision in my life. I just do what I think is right. If that's you, that's fine. That's where I was that day when I came to this church myself. I had never done any of those things. That's all right. What, what, did, what did Paul say? That he's not far from any of us. Wherever you're at, you just turn to him. Just turn to him and say, Jesus, come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. I don't want to live like this no more. I want the truth. I want to spend eternity in heaven, not hell. I want, to take the, I want to take this sin burden off me. Because God, you put a conscience in me, and I'm just defiling that conscience. I'm overriding it all the time. And I just, I don't know about where you were before you got saved, but I was pulling my hair out. I did not like my own self. The world didn't make sense. I couldn't connect any dots without the Word of God. But when, when, I, when I began to read the Word of God, I, get, I, I got His Spirit on the inside of me and began to read. Everything began to make sense. Everything began, oh, now I see. I once was blind, but now I see. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I mean, I, it, it was the most exciting time of my life. It was the most exciting time when I became a true Christian. A lot of times people will ask me, I think Terry asked me, you know, they're moving. And, uh, you know, if, if somebody, they're moving to another church, and they've been a, such a blessing to this church, if somebody would like to, you know, give them a, a Holy Ghost handshake with a 20 in it or something like that, you know, for their move to bless them on their way out, they, they got about three or four more weeks, that would be a good thing to do. That would be a church, that would be a good church thing to do, to bless that family. They've been such a blessing, working in with the children, Where's Terry? His head would puff up so big if he was in here to hear all this. You know, Terry gets here every morning about 8.30. He brings his family. And uh, he cuts on all the lights and does all the thermostats and cuts on the screens back there and, and takes the sign out to the front. Just a beautiful family. Man, we're going to miss them bad. But anyway, I think Terry asked me, when I get to Texas, how am I going to find a good church? What do, you, what do you suggest? Do you know any good churches in Texas? No. <laughs> but I would say don't look for big buildings. Look for big hearts. Don't look for gimmicks. Look for the genuine. Don't look for entertainment, but look for worship. And look for hearts filled with repentance, bent on replication. Look for people who w want other people to have what they have. A soul winning church. Look for these things. You can't go wrong in a Bible believing soul winning church that, that has the love of God. Genuine to the word of God. Basically I would tell them to look for a church like ours. Filled with Christmas Christians. I wrote this down about our church. You can believe it if you want to, but I believe it. From our hearts, we love God, His people, and His purposes. I, I truly believe that. I wrote that we know Him. 
that we're doers of the word, that we're tithers, we're givers, we're worshipers, we are prayer warriors, we're true disciples. And we're making true disciples who would take up their cross and follow the Lord. That's, that's our what. That's what we do. And that's why we do it. That's what I believe about this church. I believe that we keep oil in our lamps. That's why you keep coming. To get filled up. To stay filled with His Holy Spirit. I believe that we're not stiff-necked, always rejecting things that we don't understand because they're spiritual. I believe that we ask the Holy Spirit to fill us. So that we're empowered with the power of God. The same power that raised Christ from the dead. Now dwells in our mortal bodies. And resurrects us from this darkness that we live in. And puts, puts wind under our sails. And it, under our wings. And empowers us to overcome. And I believe we keep oil in our lamps. And a trowel and a sword in our hands. That means... This is the sword of the Spirit. We keep this in one hand and we keep a trial, meaning we're building the church because that's what Jesus came to do through his people is to build his church. I believe in the church. I believe in us. You're not the church by yourself. You're just a brick lost off the side of where you're supposed to be at some church. Together, we are living stones. Together, we are living stones that makes up the body of Christ. And I believe in the church. And I believe in you. And I believe that we're going to stir ourselves in these final hours and we are going to do what God has called us to do. And I'm going to keep stirring you up until you, until you go talk bad about me at, at lunch. And then I'm going to do it some more. Look, rejoice. Everybody do this right here. A Savior was sent unto us. <laughs> Emmanuel, God is with us. You know, Jesus breathed on his disciples. I say Jesus breathed on us and revive us again. Do it again. Take in a deep breath of God's breath. Breathe on me, Jesus. Breathe on me. Revive me again. Stir in my heart. Help me, O oh Lord, because we serve a risen Savior who came to show us the way, who equipped us for battle, and He's coming back again. And He's looking for a church without spot or wrinkle. He's looking for a victorious church. He's looking for a, this church to be who they're called to be.